morning. So, um, I'm standing here today because the talk that you were scheduled to have with Michael uh, couldn't take place, and I thought it's better for him to do that kind of talk. And for me, after yesterday's uh, discussion, to possibly volunteer myself just to take on any Q and A's that you might have from a distributor point of view. I'll give you an overview of Aquamuri. This is our website, this is our retail website. Um, at the moment we list around 52, 53 different mineral waters, spring waters. Um, and we deliver them predominantly to hotels and restaurants and cafes. Um, but we also uh, come in very useful because we create pallets for other distributors, which allows a distributor that doesn't possibly have either the connections or the uh, minimum volume for some products to be able to get a mixed pallet worth of goods and introduce it to their audience, be it in the north of England, be it in Ireland. Uh, and what you see behind me is our retail website. Now this is the part where I have spent most of my time over the last 13 or so years. Um, and this is delivering directly to people's homes and offices. Um, and what we've learned from over the last 10, 10 years is that it's, mineral water isn't limited to hotels and restaurants. What you're finding is that people are going to their favorite restaurants, they're going to Claridge's, they're going to the Barclay Hotel, they're going to the Fat Duck, and they're seeing the water they've served there, and they're getting it for their own homes. And we're getting an increasing awareness now for mineral waters and a non-alcoholic future. And you saw the video yesterday about millennials, and that rings true, that now we're getting an increasing amount of university students that are just abstaining from alcohol altogether, which opens the door completely to mineral waters and soft drinks and flavored waters. Um, and with that comes the rise of what we call a uh, new wave of of packaging. So what you get now is you get products like aqua packs, which are in a tetra pack carton. Um, you also get products like cano water, which are aluminium. Um, and the last of all, if I can find it, obviously you've got your plastic and your glass. And you also get things like waterworks, which is completely <coughs> recyclable and compost um, compostable. Because even the cap is made out of sugar cane. Um, so what you what wouldn't have escaped your notice is that when there's an environmental conversation, bottled water is the first one on the wall to have the gun waved at it. <laughs> um, and that is because there's a lack of education um, and a lack of awareness um, and quite frankly uh, what comes out of the tap is transparent and it's wet but that's where the that's where the comparisons end when it comes to mineral water and so as producers as distributors as water experts as consultants our duty really promote that message that different waters have different functions and the calcium availability in mineral water is a lot more accessible for the human body than say with milk. And so what I'm going to do is rather than talk for 30 minutes, I thought it might be better for you to ask me questions um, and if you've got a query from a, from a producer point of view or what it's, what it's like to a distributor or what we look for them, I'm, I'm open. Okay. 
wasn't a growing product. So the likes of an Evian or the likes of Evolving or increasingly things that have more function to them. I'd say, for example, there's products called Active Water, which is what I guess what, what we've been referring to in this conference as the crafted water. So these waters, this is very alkaline heavy, so inspired by the US. Um, and it's also ionized, so people are buying them for their particular functions and their particular needs. But overwhelmingly, the on-the-go products, but what you'll find is the people that will order the Ross plastic for the on-the-go will order the Ross glass for their office and for their home, and if they're rich enough for their yacht. You said that um, education is the key to changing people's perceptions yeah. about the water. On your retail website, is there somewhere where you actually have some kind of platform to explain a little bit more about the water? Or do you think that's not necessary? Um, how, how do you deal with that? Okay, so it's, that's a good question because the, web, the way that Google works is that you have to be, it has to be text heavy and it also has to be very relevant. So you've got to focus but um, what, our, what we do have on our website is the allowance of people to be able to pick by pH or by pick by packaging or pick by still or sparkling. Um, and this is, you know, and this, and this helps people because generally, in my opinion, if you present people with a blind water menu or, like, or a, a choice, they will panic and they will either choose Evian or Avocado because they don't want to be put on the spot. They want to make a decision and there's someone standing over them in a restaurant. <laughs> I have a question. Can you give us a rough estimate? How much are your online sales to individual consumers versus your, your other business? Is this a significant part of your business? It is it's around 65% of the trade to around and how is the on how are the online sales delivered does it go to FedEx or how? so uh, that's, a, that's a good question as well so uh, mineral water is heavy and fragile um, and it costs a lot to come to them and it annoys customers because if they want a, a package delivered to their home you can what we always say is you can have three things there's three options which is a good service a good price um, or a good product and you can only have two of them at the same time <laughs> and and when it comes to mineral water we we deliver in our own vehicles for a minimum order of 60 pounds and for those that customers will get a white glove service they'll have it delivered into their kitchen if they want. They can have a two hour delivery window. And if they want to order by the case, they can have it delivered by DHL, they can have it delivered by UPS. They can come and collect it if they want. But ultimately, uh, when we start understanding that a large part of our business is logistics, and not so much what we're selling, but how we're selling it and how we're delivering it, then, then that's the key, I, I believe, to in the market and give them, make them more accessible to the everyday public. Do you have to repackage the bottles or are you giving you, sending your original cases? In our own, in our own vehicles, they go out as they, as they are. So our drivers collect, because, because uh, quite frankly, if you send something out to a third party network, you can't legislate at all for stupidity or mishandling. And, uh, Customers have, and so what we've started to do is we've started to use the plastic air pack packaging, which is massively, massively against the tide <laughs> when it comes to the fluffy world of, 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 uh, of recycling and, and cutting down on plastic. But the, the options there are either you receive a box of broken glass <laughs> or you receive a package that unfortunately yes you might have to puncture it and you might have to put it in your own recycling bin. But you know I enjoy everyone, that puncture. Everyone has bam, it. bam, bam. <laughs> well, yeah, um but yeah, so that is the that, that's 
say that, that's a key component, but unfortunately, uh, you know, I, I've got a video that I've just taken from my phone of outside our business area of the uh, DHL delivery driver who stacked all the boxes on to the back of the vehicle. He's looking on the pad as to what he's delivering, and one by one, he's pushing them off the side. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to prevent panic in that sense. <laughs> so you've got to just find a way to deliver it to the customer and deliver it with good time and a good and, and a good service. And, and that's how that's how they succeed in my opinion. You said that some students are drinking beer bottles on the road. Yes. And why is that? Is that like the cost like a broad demographic or because um, education as to health and welfare. Um, so what we have, what we're seeing now, is there's a growth of vegan, vegan existence, which wasn't when when I was at university, it was quite frankly how cheap to buy my pet, buy my car. Uh, whereas now we, we, people don't drink alcohol. So when you go into the university shops, there's maybe six or seven different waters. There's a whole fridge full of soft drinks because they want to promote wellness and wellness and health.
So glass is third, obviously, but it's more expensive and heavier. Um, trend is now moving towards things like petrol pack and aluminium cans as part of the recycling element. Um, perhaps, perhaps, but then it, there is a there is a stem of a tide that people aren't understanding, like um, petrol pack cartons have a layer of plastic inside, and there's only two um, there's only two areas that you can actually recycle. Likewise, can, the cans have plastic inside to stop them from them having damage or um, permeate into the water. And potentially, long term, uh, introducing water with aluminium isn't the best idea anyway because having aluminium in your plug system isn't a great idea. So, that's why people do things like things like beach recycling and stuff like this. There's lots of small companies here with new brands. Yeah. They're probably very keen to get into your company of distribution. Can you give people an idea of how you evaluate whether you want to incorporate new brands? What, what do you look for? I'm sure you get bombarded with lots of offers, but yeah. there's a limit to what you can do, I guess. We do. Um, what I would advise there is that you come with a plan because, in my opinion, the days of sending to the UK and hoping for the best and hoping for another order, a long, long gone. And uh, we're, we're not a sales agency. We, we never profess to be a sales agency. We specialize in water and soft drinks and an excellent service. That's what we do. So the important thing is to have a plan. Come, who do you want to market it to? What kind of marketing budget do you have to raise the awareness? Do you want to be want to be a product that, that enters a race to the bottom, uh, and by race to the bottom I mean uh, a product that is as available as cheap as possible to be able to take part in all the tenders. So once upon a time, that was hill the water. Um, now, more frequently, it's, uh, it's things down water. Um, there's also another water called Elm. All of these people are trying to sell glass bottles as cheaply as possible and either they are people shit and, and they are most often they're not so it's a sick. So you've got to be you've got to be realistic and you've got to help your distributors. From a distributor point of view, it's naive to send stuff out to the UK and, and just hope for the best. You've got to if you're passionate about your product, there's nothing stopping you from speaking to your chef in if you know the people in the UK, to say, look, can you can can you have a, a case of this and give it to your chef? Help your help your distributor out. And what we find is that once you get one sale and a, and the wheel starts turning, it turns very quickly. Mike, you want to say It depends. It depends where you want to distribute it for. If you want it to be in a supermarket, if you want it to be uber premium, so um, in that case, it's sold at a very high price on a retail channel, and possibly three months in Selfridges or Harrods or, or Harvey Nicks. Um, and press isn't all, uh, any any coverage you get from newspapers is good attention. Put a heavy emphasis on where you want it to be and what kind of establishments. <coughs> and if there's one beacon establishment that you can that you can get to, like a Noma, like for example a Claridge's, aim for those ones because the entree market is is full of it's it's all chiefs and no Indians. So everyone's a decision maker. But what they really do is they look at the at the
I, I think I understand the question. I just want to just give, you, just give the channel if you're like the same for for market for somewhere where you get help as well with marketing and all that stuff. You said that you use more or less for the channel for us to sell our water as what you do the marketing. Yeah. So um, <coughs> by by that I mean that it's not the case of just sending something right. to the UK yeah. and hoping that it sells. Yeah. I'm wondering. And so therefore you your there's a lot of resources now to be able to do marketing. Say, for example, you could employ a sales agent for one or two days a week to visit establishments, target, say, for example, you're an Italian water, target Italian restaurants and explain to them why they should take your product over San Pellegrino or Ashton Pad. You can do, you can give out free samples with every order for certain products. You can donate 10 cases and say, look, any order or a box, give them a bottle of bar water and give them a leaflet. That's what I was going to do. You can partake in Facebook advertising, in Instagram advertising. You know, if you're on a low sodium diet, here's a water for you. If you've got gout, here's a water for you. If you're interested in waters in general, your general sort of well being, here it goes on Instagram. It's there for you. No, 
I was just even feeling that from a brand's perspective, sometimes the story is different between countries. So in the UK, we want to really be able to start to take it up among the customers while they're buying it in the UK, because we can do something completely different. So we have another focus that we want to have the one because with our particular base brand strategy, what we want to do is we help you with the marketing to be able to do even better marketing with the data back. So we like putting more cars on the Yeah, I mean, we, a, a big factor is people understanding the story of the water <coughs> and the health benefits of the water and why it's different to what they're getting at the moment. That's the that's that's the big um, aspect that helps people make their decision. Um, because people want to understand why they're getting that standing commission. They like seeing the photos of ice cream. But I think the question is just like everything is that do you collect all this metadata and do you provide this data with the backwards to the to the brand so they get an even better understanding of their, uh, of their customers? <coughs> yeah, um, we can do we tend we tend not to. Because it's sensitive data and London's very competitive. And if that falls into the wrong hands, mm -hmm. then, then uh, as in, when, you're, when you're competing with alcohol distributors, mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with people that are getting large, large amounts of money mm -hmm. as incentives, money that isn't available to water distributors in the big enterprises. So we have to protect our data ultimately. But we have, a, we have an interest in helping brands to grow in the market because once they once they start having a really good relationship with a with a producer, then it really opens up. Like, like I mentioned before, because if you if you're both honest with one another, if you if they take your advice on board and say, look, you know your your product is what we call a premium product, so perhaps. Advertise it to people that want to buy what, but want to sell me something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we tend to be not as much. Um, ten years ago, the Claridge's Hotel in London had a, a water menu, yeah. and I remember recently Michael managed to get a water menu into a hotel in Belfast. He got a lot of publicity. Yeah. I just wanted to ask whether you felt that kind of uh, initiative is pretty much just a marketing gimmick or whether it does have some impact and whether that might be something for some small brands to maybe look at collaborating as a way of kind of just getting a foothold in the market. You know, I know you've got existing brands, but maybe somebody would, might like to jump in and help and see if whether London is, is yeah. open to their brand. How, how do you feel about water menus? Um, they need to, like, I mean, in an ideal world, we would all replicate Jessica and have on every table and being able to give you guidance, but you can't, unfortunately you can't have that. Um, the Clarence <coughs> Water Menu was uh, a, a headline grabber um, because that, that theirs was a collection of waters but for no particular purpose. The one that Michael created in um, the, the Merton Hotel in Belfast was was excellent because it was, it was really, Michael made it really functional and really relevant. And obviously, the iceberg water stole the headlines because it was, I think, a 12 pounds bottle, 16 pounds bottle, were the headlines. But um, what I will say is the UK market wants to be really doubtful and cynical of different waters. So, um, what happened on that occasion was when we were launching it, um, a lot of the journalists went there with their headline already written about the 16 pounds bottle. Water, <laughs> it, when tap water costs 0.01p. Um, and so in that instance, Michael just had all the journalists in one room and said, look, I'm going to leave the room, fill up, here's all the waters on the table, fill them up, and then give them to me, and I'll tell you. And when, and when they recorded it, and they could see that every glass of water that Michael was picking up was saying, that's iceberg, that's everything. That's uh, that, that's Volvic. Then people start understanding. And when you when you give people or, and when people doubt you, and when they wonder whether a water menu really works or whether it's just a collection of the same water in different bottles, by all means, give them a glass of Evian or give them a glass of Volvic and say, does it taste the same? And if they want to know any more, 
get their favourite glass or of whiskey, they chuck it with two different waters and find out does it have the same effect or is there something in the glass? So to answer your question very shortly, water menus are relevant and they're and they're and they're good ways of introducing products, <coughs> but they have to be they have to be on that list for a particular reason and there has to be a story. And, the, and that story, in my in my opinion, isn't only to complement the wine, but to go one step further and, and uh, enhance the wine and, uh, and food thereafter. Food's a lot harder, I believe, to drink than that. There's a texture on top of it, which is not good for a smell. Could I put you on the spot and say, well, do you think it would be a maybe a, a, a mini project for Fine Waters to say, look, Let's try and find a hotel or a restaurant in London that might be interested, and then try and find people who are prepared to participate. I don't know whether that would be too too ambitious, or what do you think? We have the Brexit coming up. Oh yeah, yeah Brexit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Put you on the spot, but by all means, you can. I mean, that that is slightly putting me on. <laughs> I don't know what products are going to be there. I don't know. The Michael will get annoyed now. <laughs> I don't know the logistics of it. I don't know why they're going to be on that menu. No, but I mean, yeah. just to focus minds more than anything, you know, to see if there was really some way we could get the fine waters message out to a maybe a wider audience. You know, so because you guys are motivated, maybe it's a way that. I mean, this uh, it, it kind of it kind of um, goes with what Michael's initial talk today was going to be about. But um, my belief is that if you want to start um, introducing different waters, you've got to have a common way of describing things beyond <coughs> beyond just mouthfeel, because uh, you know people use so many different terms. I mean, I'm sure when Michael set up Fine Waters maybe 10, 15 years ago, he had long hair and a ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said, this guy was pure. We have now the emerging group of water sommeliers. Yes. As a portfolio distributor, what do you see the relationship? Because I would be really, really interested in a very close relationship between the water sommeliers and the distributors locally and internationally. Always be advocates um, in, their, in their native markets, um, <coughs> and it's always good to uh, have people that have a vested interest in waters. Um, but what what is a what is a water sommelier really? Um, because if you do different courses, you're going to come out of it with different information and different programs. Um, so it's important to have common, a common language and a common understanding, and a, you know, and, and a relevant common message for for not only um, top end hotels but for the everyday public. Because believe me, after 12 years of selling water online, for every water sommelier, there's probably going to be around 200 members of the public that have a favourite water and and have always loved water and have found that their conversations about water have always fallen on deaf ears because no one can quite explain why. You know, they know why they prefer volume to everything, but they can't explain why. <coughs> Thank you very much. brands and they tell me I need to sell my water I tell them please remember you're not selling water you're selling a story and I think 